I was living in my first apartment post-college with my fiancé and my Siamese cat. My fiancé worked nights sometimes, and my little Siamese was the chillest, meekest little thing. The apartment was the top floor of a rehabbed house. It had once been an attic. All the walls were angles and the windows were in the eaves. The front door was at the bottom of a flight of steep wooden stairs and opened onto the external concrete landing at the back of the house. The back of the house was a wooded lot with some other houses nearby, but none in direct line of sight. I was used to my boyfriend coming home late. I would be dead asleep when I'd hear his key in the lock and his feet coming up the wood stairs. One night my tiny little shadow of a Siamese cat took to mewing. I could hear her sitting at the bottom of the stairs where the door opened, meowing every few seconds in a soft, questioning, but very, very insistent way. Silence, mew, silence, mew. Just barely insistent enough to bring me half awake at 2.45 to 3 a.m. I was lying there wondering, what the hell? I couldn't even form coherent thoughts, just vaguely registering the meowing in the completely dark house in a stupor sleep state. Then I heard it. The doorknob at the front of the stairs was turning, gently. Someone was outside on the back stoop, in the dark, unobservable from the street, gently twisting the knob this way, then that. Click, click this way, then that way. I could barely hear them doing it. I wasn't 100% sure I was hearing it correctly. Then they tried again, twisting softly, pushing gently. Thump, thump as the door barely moved in the jam, then twisting the knob this way and that away again. Click, click. I shot up 150% wide awake. I sat up in bed, gently put my feet on the floor, and my cat raced up the stairs and sat down and looked at me, like, finally human, come on, do something. She was completely silent after that. I stepped quietly onto the floor, called my boyfriend to ask if he was trying to get in the back door and lost his keys. He said no. What the fuck? He wasn't even in the same state, overnight delivering and driving. He told me to hang up, call 911 right now, and get the handgun. Turn on every light in the house but stay away from the windows and to call him right back and remain on the phone with him until the cops arrive. I immediately acted. The door rattling stopped and the cops came. They kind of beat the bushes in a circle around the house, said it was probably just a homeless person trying to get in from the cold. But when both our downstairs neighbor and my fiancé were away, maybe, but still... It's not like it would take days of super sleuthing to connect one car to me, the other cars to the others, and deduce there was a woman there alone. They said they would increase the patrols on the street for the night. Fiancé raced home an hour and a half early from his night delivery run and also circled the house, yard, and a lot on foot. Marine reconnaissance boyfriends are pretty awesome. Until that night I had never known my sweet little Siamese was actually a guard cat in disguise. I'd heard stories of cats waking their family up in fires or carbon monoxide situations, but figured those were already aggressive, extroverted, attention-seeking cats. My meek little scaredy cat would disappear when people came over and was like an unseen shadow, but she threw down that night in her own way. Then she went back to being an unamusing cat, but I knew if she hadn't deliberately woken me up, I wouldn't have heard it. Even my fiancé, who isn't a cat person, was impressed. It never happened again, but ever since then I cannot stand to live on ground floor apartments. I require second or third floor like that one was. But I knew until the cops arrived there was only one way into that place, and I was standing at the head of those stairs, armed and ready. So I just got a new job back in October working tech support on the graveyard shift. I worked from 1am to 12pm Friday through Mondays. Needless to say, adjusting my sleep schedule has been quite the task, but I've managed. 
On the days I don't work, I still follow my work schedule, waking up at midnight and staying up until at least 2 p.m. before falling asleep to keep my sleep schedule in line with my work schedule. I bought blackout curtains to help with this, as trying to sleep with the sun shining is not easy for me. I usually require complete darkness. I live alone, and I started noticing weird things happening around my apartment when I would get home from work, or after waking up on my days off. Just little things at first, lights being on that I swear I turned off, doors being left open or closed. Just so everyone can get a bit of understanding about my apartment, I live on the second floor and my building is right behind the leasing office. The entrance to my apartment requires you to enter the building first, then there is a hallway with two apartments on either side, then you can enter the apartment. Each apartment has two deadbolts, one that you can unlock from the outside and another that requires you to unlock from the inside. There is also a balcony which faces east, complete with a large sliding glass door and screen. I use it quite frequently, as I had potted plants out there, but I have brought them inside due to the cold weather. I also have two cats, Luna and Eclipse, who until recently live with me. I'm moving soon and can't afford the pet deposit, so my parents offered to let them stay at their place for the time being. Eclipse is Luna's daughter and only six months old, so she follows her mom around all the time. I'd usually find them cuddled up together on my chair or bed and recently, they trapped themselves in the bathroom. Now that they're not here, it's gotten harder to pass off these weird occurrences as my cats. Doors are still being left open and closed, and food has been disappearing from my fridge. At first I passed this off as just being my usual self and just not remembering that I ate something when I was half asleep or bored. Recently, my boss gave me permission to work from home as this shift is brand new and the company is moving to 24-7 support, and the building owner refuses to heat my floor for my shift for only two people. So, I've been doing that for the past couple of weeks, and last week, I noticed the metal rod that acts as a secondary lock on the balcony door wasn't engaged, so I put it back. I didn't think much of it at the time, as my computer faces my balcony door, and I sometimes fidget with it with my feet while playing video games. On the 11th of December, my credit card information was stolen and my account was charged $3,000 plus. I was in the office that day as a favor to my co-worker, who was really creeped out being in the office alone in the middle of the night. The charge was made at 11.40 a.m., just a few moments before I'd gotten off of work, and I had the card on me still. I was restless and didn't sleep well. I wake up at midnight per usual on Monday morning, and get my setup ready to take calls. Now, almost no calls come in on the weekends, so I'm usually screwing around on Reddit, Facebook, YouTube, and Netflix. Around 3 a.m., I was catching up on the hundred when someone unlocked my fucking door. I don't mean pick the lock, I mean use the key. Thank God the secondary deadbolt was engaged, but the person jiggled the door to try to get it open. I ran and grabbed my gun, looked out the peephole, but saw nothing. I opened the door with the intent to shoot someone, but the person was already gone. Before you ask, yes I called the cops. No, they didn't find anything. There are no cameras in the hallways of the building or outside them for that matter, and they told me that there wasn't enough evidence for them to do anything about it and left. I didn't sleep at all the next night and decided to stay home on my days off to try and catch the person if they tried to come back. I also asked the leasing office if they handed out any extra keys to my apartment, and they said no, and informed them that I changed the locks on my door. Now my storage closet opened with the same key for the deadbolt. I keep my Christmas tree decorations in there and decided it was time to set it up. As I'm pulling out the tree this evening, it's only a five foot tall fake tree that has all the lights attached to it already and I notice a bag back behind it, a small black duffel bag in it. I found a change of clothes, sunglasses, shoes, toiletries and a notebook. What was in the notebook horrified me. There were notes about me, what hours and days I worked, notes about my cats, 
and updated notes that they were no longer there in the date and my fucking credit card number. As I went further and further back in the notes, I found two words circled multiple times. Balcony door, which I assume is how the person entered my apartment for the first time. This creep had been living in my apartment while I had been at work for the past month, and I didn't even know it. The worst part is that I was in my apartment at the same time as this guy at some point and didn't even know it. That's the only way he would have gotten my credit card number and my house key to make a copy somewhere. I've called the police and they're on their way over. I'm writing this as I'm waiting for them to show up. It's the only thing that's keeping me sane right now. Plus I think it will help me organize my thoughts so I can best explain to the officers what had just happened. I've called the police and they're on their way over. I'm writing this as I'm waiting for them to show up. It's the only thing that's keeping me sane right now. Plus, I think it will help me organize my thoughts so I can best explain to the officers what had just happened. I'll keep you guys updated as things progress. Major update. The police have identified the person who used my credit card information. They're going to try to see if there's any connection between the person who used my information and the person who left the bag behind. Yesterday while walking around alone the local superstore on my way home from work, I spotted this group of three younger men. I'm typically the type to keep my head down and just keep walking on, but they were acting loud and carrying on in the store, so it was hard not to stare for a second. I moved on and went to the automotive section, and they were there. Grabbed a few cans of pet food, and as I rounded the corner, they were there again. No big deal, I thought and carried on with my shopping as these things happen all the time. As I stopped in the pharmacy area, they were there again. I made eye contact and smiled at one of them, as I wasn't uncomfortable at this time. He didn't smile back, and gave me a very cold stare. It was strange, but I was thinking, well maybe that person had a bad day. Shrugged it off and prepared myself for the potential hell that the checkout lines can be sometimes at these places. I looked up while I was waiting to pay and noticed that the men were there, waiting at the end of the scanner aisles on benches. Again, I thought, eh, no big deal, and grabbed my bag of goodies and was on my way out. I didn't see anyone as I was walking out of the store but remember thinking it was strange how I seemed to keep running into the same people inside a huge superstore like that. I typically park on the side of the building. There are more parking spaces than the front, and it's easier to get in and out. So as I exit, I recognize the same group of three men who I had seen around the store. Keys in hand, I walk towards my car about 30 feet away. When I'm about 5 feet from my car, I hear loud steps coming up behind me. At this point I'm thinking, maybe they're just going to the car next to mine. Unfortunately that was not the case. I get in and lock my doors out of habit, just as the three men surround my vehicle, asking me, where you going sweetheart, we just want to talk. One is trying to open my front passenger side door, the others are standing next to my back driver's side door and behind my car. At this point, my heart is racing, and without giving it a second thought, I put my car in reverse and sped out of that parking space like a bat out of hell. As I was putting my car in reverse to drive, they had one more opportunity to say something to me. We're here all the time. See you soon, sweetheart. Luckily, I was able to get out of the parking lot and get home, although a little shaken. This is from the point of view of myself, dad, and my sister. This was about two years ago when I was 16. It was Monday morning, around 6am. My dad, two sisters, and myself were at home sleeping while my mom was out at the gym. My sister had heard someone ring the doorbell. She was about to get up and answer it when she heard my dad's footsteps heading toward the door, 
so she went back to sleep. That's when she heard my dad's footsteps go from walking to pacing back and forth around the house. She heard my dad talking to the cops saying that someone was on the front lawn and if they can come and get him. Fast forward to almost a half hour later and that's when I woke up to my dad screaming. At first I was thinking that my parents were fighting but then I heard a window break from my parents' room. That's when I got up from my bed, got a bat, and went out. And just as I was getting out from my room, and my father was closing his door to his room, I saw this huge guy. He reminded me of Mr. T, climbing inside through the window. As my dad was shutting the door, he put his feet up against a file cabinet we have, and his back towards the door with a katana samurai sword in hand avid knife and sword collector, keeping the guy out of the rest of the house. While my dad was doing this, he was talking, screaming to the 911 operator saying that it was the third time he had called the cops and nobody had shown up and the guy was inside our house. I told my dad to give me the phone because I was a little more calm and I answered the questions of the operator. That's when the guy started pushing against the door trying to get through and my dad told me to get back and protect my sisters if the guy were to get through, so I did. Luckily, the man had stopped pushing the door, and the cops at last got there. Two cops went inside the room with tasers drawn and told the man to get on the floor. He just looked at them and started walking towards them, and that's when the cops fired their tasers and all the guy did was look at the darts and say, Ow, and then proceeded to take them off. At the end, the cops were able to talk him down and get him in cuffs. The cops told us he might have been on PCP and was just looking for a place to sleep because he only had on shoes and shorts. What my dad told us afterwards was that the man had opened the side door and went around back and went inside the dog's house to sleep. We used to have a big husky before he passed away. And afterwards had got my scooter I had left outside and smashed my parents' window. He climbed in and got my mom's iPad and went on YouTube looking at the most popular videos. My mom got home to a scene of six squad cars and two fire trucks outside of the house. What's crazy is that my dad was going to go to the gym as well, but he got lazy and slept in. I don't know what I would have done if my dad wasn't there, but I'm grateful he was. I'm also glad the man didn't break into the front because then we would have had to fight the guy since he would have been near my sister's room. When they were talking him out, the cops and paramedics saw that he was too big to fit with the gurney, so they told him he was going to have to walk, and he says, Oh, nah, man. You gonna make me walk? I don't know exactly what happened to him afterwards, but big guy that broke into my house that reminded me of Mr. T, I pity you. my wife and I welcomed our son, Lucas, six months ago. It's been a learning curve and this having babies things is not for the birds, but things are finally starting to go smoothly. He is finally sleeping through the night and that nasty colic he had is gone. I'm very lucky I get to work from home. Even luckier, my wife owns her own business. She's a photographer. She's home whenever she's not shooting a wedding or at her studio. Most mornings we take a six and a half mile walk and Lucas is strapped into his baby carrier and we take off. We usually make it around halfway before we need to stop to give the little man a bottle so he will pass out and let us finish the walk in peace. So like usual we are about halfway done with our walk and the baby starts cranking up for a massive squall. We usually normally stop at either a park or this nice fountain area with a coffee shop and grocery store attached. We both wanted coffee in the worst way, so while I sat with the baby, wife went into the coffee shop for our caffeine. I am slowly rocking Lucas as I feed him, when I hear someone sit on the bench next to me. I smell her before I see her, a heavy, cloying perfume. She's dolled up to the nines, an older woman. Between her late thirties to forties, she has that hard look that makes her look older than she probably is. What kind of baby is that? She inquires in a heavy Russian accent. 
I have a propensity for being a smartass, so I reply. A baby? No, what kind? Boy, girl? She asks as she starts smoothing out the romper we have on the baby. He's a boy. Six months old. I add, a little freaked out this perfect stranger is touching my kid. Looks healthy. How much he weigh? She asks, trying to pull the baby to her to get a good look at him. Now I am hoping that my wife will come out any second, but of course she's in line waiting for our cappuccinos. Um, I think 18 pounds? He was 9 pounds at birth. I ramble on, hoping she will just go away. Lucas is drifting off to sleep when she leans over and just snatches him out of my arms. Ah, uh, let me see, big boy. Big frame like Papa. Well, big, big baby, no? Now I am pissed. I ask for him back while I glance in the coffee shop. My wife is at the counter at this point. Hand him over, now. I ask firmly, not to mention he is now awake and he is totally in that stranger danger stage, so he was pissed. She reluctantly hands him over. I try to begin to try and calm him down, so at first I don't hear what she asks. How much for baby? I hear the second time. He's not for sale? I am incredulous and thankfully I see my wife get our drinks and grab napkins and creamer. How much you want? I pay high price for baby. She starts touching him again and I yank him backwards. My wife finally comes out and sees the lady touching our kid. My wife is a total mama bear so she gives the lady dagger eyes. So she gets up and before she goes she looks at me and says, What'd you think about it, da? Then she walks away. I tell my wife everything, and of course she's as freaked out as me. Luckily it's been a week and a half, and we haven't yet to run into her again. In high school I had to write a paper which summarized my life story starting from birth. I reflected on my earliest memories and when I remembered this, I had to sit down. My heart pounded as I realized what had actually happened and what my four-year-old self couldn't understand. When I was a kid, my family often vacationed with their friends' as family and we all lived together in a giant beach house or cabin for a week. This must have been one of the first of those vacations. I wanted to hang out with the rest of the kids but since they were at least one year older than me, they thought I was uncool. I followed my sister around the house, but since she didn't want to play with me, I mostly just eavesdropped on everybody's conversations. One day, all the kids happened to be in one room. No adults, plenty of toys, hella fun. Off to the side was this tiny door, the tiniest I'd ever seen, which led to a dark, empty room. I remember we were absolutely fascinated by that tiny door, and the older kids would make up stories about it. Jennifer was the eldest, and in my memory she was a teenager, but that might have been skewed since I thought everyone was in the double digits was super mature. She even knew how to use her mom's cell phone. All the kids were playing, having fun, enjoying their childhood. Then Jennifer got a call. She had to ask us to be quiet several times, and she sounded really serious. I thought this request was silly and a little annoying since I really wanted to play. The call ended. Jennifer told us, My dad's coming back here soon. Jennifer's dad had driven away for a few hours but was now driving back. Someone asked questions about where he went and what he was doing. I think she said something about drinking. At some point Jennifer addressed all of us and said something like, my dad looks at kids and takes them on drives. You all have to be really careful when he comes back. I couldn't grasp anything else, she said. Then she talked to a girl and a boy. I noticed he was looking at you two a lot, so you both have to be really, really careful. I think he wants to take you each on a drive, but don't go with him if he asks. 
Their conversation went on for a while, and I felt jealous that they talked so much with Jennifer and that her dad was looking at them instead of me. Why wasn't I special? I grew bored of listening to them and went back to playing. A car pulled up and Jennifer told us to go into the tiny door room. We brought some toys along. I was psyched to go through the tiny door, but it ended up being a dark, empty room without any fairies or hobbits. After a while, we left. As far as I know, nothing bad happened on that trip. I grew up with the two kids Jennifer talked to, and they seemed pretty well adjusted. But Jennifer and her family never vacationed with us again. I told my family the story, and they thought it was an imaginary memory that my four-year-old brain had concocted. My parents are positive there weren't any weird, creepy, or alcoholic dads there, just their good friends. My sister didn't remember any of it. I can't rationalize how or why I would have imagined it. My childhood was great, and I had zero concept of pedophiles or alcoholism. A little background. I was about 19 at the time. I'm a half-white, skinny little female, not intimidating at all. This story takes place in Oahu, Hawaii, the Waikiki and surrounding area. So I was living with my older cousin and his family at the time, in a small city about an hour bus ride from Waikiki. My cousin had a daughter, who we'll call Maria, who was around 17 years old and, for a lack of a better phrase, extremely hot. Her side of the family is Polynesian, and so she had long, beautiful dark hair, a huge ass, and a tiny waist. She was also a wild child, but, to her father's relief, a lesbian. Because of this, her parents didn't really keep a close eye on her in school. They all openly smoked pot and drank, so they didn't really care if she did, as long as she graduated high school. She can't get pregnant, so there's not much trouble she can get into, right? Fucking wrong. One Saturday night, Maria told her parents she was staying the night at her mutual friend of ours house. I knew her friend was out of town, so I knew she was lying. I didn't want to get her in trouble, so instead of busting her, I decided to just tag along and keep an eye on her. So we got ready, said goodbye to her parents, and walked to the bus stop. Where are we really going? We're meeting the crew at Wykes. I had no idea what that meant, but didn't want to look uncool, so I just went along. An hour later, we got off the bus near downtown Waikiki. I followed her to a strip of bars on the edge of the tourist section, the last stop before the pretty lights faded and the buildings looked more closer to Detroit than Hawaii. We stopped at a punk bar called Mercury. At first I was confused because we were underage, until I spotted a group of grimy-looking local teens congregating on a fire escape in an alleyway between Mercury and a dive bar. The teenagers got excited when they saw Maria. We've been waiting for you. We got shrooms. A short-haired chick grabbed my niece into a hug, then shoved a baggie into her hand. I guess we got enough for the Howley girl, too. She's not a Howley. She's my auntie. Maria defended me and, before I could stop her, dumped the baggie of mushrooms into her mouth. Well, fuck. I wasn't really sure what to do and these teenagers were kind of sketching me out, but Maria was going to be tripping soon and I couldn't bring her home like that. She seemed to trust these kids, so I settled in without letting my guard down until I could figure out what to do. I hadn't been in Hawaii long so I had no friends to call to bail us out and give us a place to crash. It's early. She'll be fine by two or three. A voice behind me on the fire escape said. I turned to see a Japanese guy in his late twenties wearing a long sleeve shirt despite the heat. I nodded, not knowing what to say. I'm Jiro. You Maria's Ani? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Sorry I'm being a drag, I just hate babysitting people when they trip. He laughed and shook my hand. We talked amicably for about an hour or so, watching as Maria started to trip. 
She was making an ass of herself and getting a little physical with her friends, male and female. Soon enough, one of the guys took it too far and grabbed her ass. She didn't mind at first, but kept getting more and more aggressive. His hand kept inching further and further up her skirt, and even in her intoxicated state she recognized it as unwanted attention and told him to back off. He didn't take it too well. You wear a skirt like that and you think you're gonna get cherry? He spat at her, still holding onto her thigh with one hand, a four loco in the other. I didn't really understand what he was saying, but I picked up on the tone and context. This wasn't good. I stood up to step in, but Jiro beat me to it. He jumped down the side of the fire escape, landed on his feet gracefully and knocked the four loco out of the horny teenager's hand. Oh, you like throw? The teen stood, ready to fight. Jiro had his back to me, so when he lifted his shirt to expose his stomach, I was really confused. The teenager, on the other hand, understood immediately and the color left his face, along with the hormonal bravado. He looked terrified. Maria, really tripping now, scrambled her way from the teen and ran to my side. I hugged her, glad she was okay. Let's go. Jiro waved for us to follow him and, not knowing what else to do, we obliged, leaving the group of teens gaping at us as we walked away. We walked in silence for about 15 minutes until we reached a dingy small apartment complex. Jiro turned to me and asked if we'd like to come up to his place since it was so late. That way I wasn't stuck walking around Waikiki at midnight with a tripping 17 year old in a miniskirt. Seeing as he had just saved our asses and I didn't see an alternative, I said yes and we followed him up. Inside the apartment was no better than outside. It was a studio with no furniture save for a futon on the floor and a kitchen table with two chairs. The walls were bare and yellowed from cigarette smoke. There was one door leading to a tiny bathroom. Maria was starting to feel nauseous, so I laid her head on the futon and took a seat on the kitchen table next to Jiro. We talked idly for a half hour or so, just small talk. Then suddenly, Jiro took off his long sleeve shirt revealing the wife beater beneath and the tattoos. His entire torso and both arms were covered in an intricate weaving of dragons and Japanese writing. Remembering the horny teenager's reaction when Jiro showed him his stomach, my blood ran cold. This dude was a gangster. A Japanese gangster. Fucking Yakuza. I'd seen tattoos like that before, and it was no joke. Fuck. I tried to mask my surprise, but he picked up on it and smirked devilishly, clearly amused at my discomfort. I was frantically trying to plot an inconspicuous exit strategy, but coming up short, did I want to face Maria's dad's wrath or stay here with a Yakuza I'd known for all of three hours who seemed nice, if a bit distant? If what happened next hadn't happened, I don't know what I would have done, honestly. Suddenly. Jiro's phone started ringing and he walked into the bathroom before answering. I could hear him speaking Japanese angrily, seemingly arguing with whoever was on the phone. He then stormed out of the bathroom, walked over to the futon, grabbed a box from underneath it and opened it. The shoebox was filled with stacks of 20s and large bags of meth. He rifled through the box angrily, seemingly looking for something and not finding it. Maria who had earlier dozed off, was awake and watching him, wide-eyed and panicky. She started to get off the futon and Jiro snapped at her, telling her to stay put. She froze. Uh, I think we should go. She seems okay. We should go before the last bus runs. I lied quickly, knowing the buses had stopped running hours ago. I had money for cab fare. You're not going anywhere. My shit's missing. You were here the whole time. When will we have time to take your shit? He looked annoyed. Then like he was thinking. Empty your purses and pockets. We obliged. Take off your bra and show me you're not hiding anything. We did this as well, reluctantly. Maria was crying now. I tried to stay calm. Can we go now? 
Get the fuck out of my sight. We booked it out of his apartment without looking back. As soon as we got outside, I called us a cab. We rode home in silence, knowing we dodged a bullet. I'd like to say Maria calmed down after this, but that's not true. She's in her 20s now and just as wild, but as far as I know, she's stayed away from shrooms and Yakuza since that night. This is a precautionary tale. I understand that it was my own fault, but maybe if I can help one person by telling my story, it's worth it. I don't drink as a general rule, but once a month or so I'll go out with friends and binge. My friends and I had a great night at a bar in the city, and they left. I was chatting it up with a cute guy, so I decided to stay. I went back to his place, post-coitus, very unsatisfying for anyone interested, I'm ready to head home so I call an Uber to pick me up. I don't know where I am. I know the city I'm in but not my exact location. I order the Uber but it's taking forever. Requesting, requesting, requesting. So I cancel it and try again. Pretty soon a car pulls up. I drunkenly mumble something like, This an Uber? And I hop in. Mistake. Ubers apparently are supposed to have some kind of marking on the vehicle. The guy pulls away and starts driving. We're chatting and I'm fumbling for a cigarette. The next thing I notice is that we're headed on the highway, but in the opposite direction of where I thought we needed to drive, and we're going at a solid 90 miles per hour. Then I get a call from my Uber driver. He's there, and I'm not, because I'm in a car with a fucking nutcase. I start texting my friend, frantically counting off mile markers for her. Then I realize that's going to do Jack, because she's probably drunk too. So I call 911, but I realize this guy is crazy. He's refusing to let me out of the car, so I've got to do it on the sly. It's been 40 minutes now. I'm terrified. I don't know where I am. I don't know who this is. We're driving at over 100 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. This guy is trying to get me to hang up my phone call. Yo, get off the phone, the fuck are you calling? Better not be a snitch. And also smoking pot, so I don't want to do anything that might provoke a violent reaction from him. I start chatting to the 911 dispatcher as if it's my friend, praying that they'll catch on. Hey girl, it's me. Yeah, I'm with someone right now, we're driving past Highway 81. No sweetie, it's not my Uber. I thought it was, but it's not. It's a shame you can't come and meet me and bring friends. Thanks, sweet baby Jesus. The operator catches on. He gets me to stay on the phone while he sends cops, and we develop a code. If I see cops, I'm supposed to casually put my hand out the window, which looks semi-normal because I'm smoking a cigarette. We pull into some random little housing complex, and he busts out some powder and forms two lines. I now have confirmation that he does drugs, which means he's probably emotionally volatile. I relay this to the operator, in code. Oh girl, I wish you were here right now. This guy just busted out coke. You'd love it. He's taking a really big bump. Man, after my own heart. Pretty soon I can see the lights from the cop car, so I start waving my hand out the window. And at this point I don't even care if he's on to me or not. I don't know if he has a weapon, but I slump down in my seat just in case things get hot. The cops surround us, get him out of the car, and then, once it's safe, they extricate me as well. They whisk me to the hospital for drug testing and evaluation, and that's where my story ends. On my way to the hospital, as I'm explaining all of this to the officer, I find out that of the guy's 40-ish years on this earth, he's been in federal prison for 30 of them. For violent offenses. I want people to learn from my mistakes, and if nothing else, call 911 and stay on the line. This all took place when I was around 8 or 9. I lived in one of the more poor neighborhoods of Las Vegas and had always been taught the dangers of adults with bad intentions. 
I had a best friend at the time, Gavin, who apparently had not been taught the same as me. Every single day, Gavin and I would walk home from the school, the three blocks from the elementary school down to his house, and then finally mine at the end of the street. We had been doing this for the better half of the school year without instance. However, all it took was one singular moment for that all to change. Gavin and I were making our regular trek from school towards Gavin's house, making jokes and exploring what we were going to do that day. It was usually watching Pokemon and reenacting our own favorite scenes from the most recent episode. As we turned onto the street, a beat up old red truck stopped on the road and a ratty looking older man with a salt and pepper beard and bloodshot hues stuck his head out of the grimy looking vehicle and immediately leaned towards Gavin and I and in a sickly innocent voice. Would you do help me find my dog? I think she's just down the block. She likes to run off on me and I could really use your help. I was skeptical at best. I shook my head and explained that I really had to get home and that my mother was waiting for me. But Gavin... Gavin promptly said yes and ran towards the truck without a second's hesitation. I was frozen in place. My frame iced over in a cold fear and suspicion. The truck took off and I was left on the side of the road cursing Gavin and wondering what in the hell was I going to do now. As a child, I didn't realize that that moment could have been the last I would ever see of my best friend. I didn't put it together that the man was full of evil intentions and just wanted a child or two to do God knows what to them. A dozen thoughts ran through my mind of whether to get Gavin's mother or my own, but at that moment, the very real thought that he was attempting to kidnap us wasn't on my mind. All I knew was that he gave me a very bad vibe and I was never to go off with strangers. I had only made it a couple of more steps down the road before the unmistakable clunking of the man's red truck hissed up behind me. I was frozen fear before it quickly took off, speeding away and leaving Gavin in its midst. I was so relieved. I turned and saw my friend clutching a dollar to his chest and running towards me, showing off his new reward. I asked him if they had found the dog and Gavin said no, that they had drove around the block and he was given the dollar and dropped back off on our street. We never told our parents and I never saw that man again, but it wasn't until years later that I realized that the only reason that man let Gavin go was because I didn't go. And out there, an eight-year-old girl would know what this man looked like and what car he drove if Gavin never came back. Every summer since I was four, my Nana took me and my sisters to California. I always loved going, since she had a pool and let me drive around on her golf cart. I blamed teenager angst, since I was turning 15 that summer, but I threw a huge fit to my mom over going. I had just gotten a boyfriend and didn't want to go long distance for a month, and all three of my younger sisters were going to tag along, meaning I had to babysit. Mom put her foot down told me to suck it up, so obviously I was going to be a pretty pissy teen the whole time. So beginning of June, we load up in Nana and Papa's van and head off. I live on a small coastal town in Oregon, so the trip was going to take around two days to get all the way down to Palm Springs. Looking back on it, I was totally miserable to be around. Picking on my sisters, ignoring my grandparents, huffing and puffing the entire time so I really don't blame them for what they did. A day had passed since we finally made it to the rental home, when my mom called, excitedly telling me that since I was older now, I got a chance to travel, that's fully paid for, how grateful I should be, etc. I interrupted her, saying that I go to Cali every year. Why is she so stoked about this time? No, kiddo. Your Aunt Pat is flying you out to stay with her for the next two whole months. She's paying for it all. Isn't that so nice? I was so confused and just stood there listening to her ramble on about the trip I was to take in a few days. Then I started to get pissy. What the fuck do you mean two months? Doesn't she live in Texas? Why am I going to fucking Texas? I was livid. Well, 
Turns out that Papa had grown tired of my teenage moods pretty fast, and rightfully so, and complained about it to his sister, Aunt Pat. She told him to send me to her, that it would be a good experience for me, all expenses paid. Nana and Papa didn't see an issue with it, and neither did my mom. I, on the other hand, saw plenty. My first thoughts were of my boyfriend back home, naturally, and being bored alone in Texas wasn't looking like a fun option either. I begged and begged my mom to let me stay in California, but she insisted that I go as a learning experience. So the next two days I was completely solemn, up until I was dropped off at the airport. It wasn't until I was actually boarding that I realized I hadn't seen my Aunt Pat or her husband Rick since I was seven. The only form of communication I had with them was the annual Christmas card with the attached $10. To be honest, I didn't even remember what they looked like. I tried texting my mom as a last-ditch effort to get out of it, but nope. The plane ticket was paid for, and I was already boarded. She argued back that I was exaggerating, that it was my papa's sister so I would be fine, and to quit complaining or she'd shut my cell phone completely off as punishment so I strapped up and flew to Texas. I didn't get into the airport until late and was worried they had forgotten about me. I get to the waiting area, and even though we were the only people there, save for one older Latino man, they were waiting with a sign plastered with my name on it. I gave a meek smile and wave, and they ran up excitedly, asking about my flight and whatnot. They were an older couple, older than I thought they were, matching gray hair and oddly tall. They both were dressed like Taurus with Hawaiian dress shirts and khakis and Rick had shades on with a safari hat even though we were inside. I figured they were just weird old people and brushed it off. We arrived back to their house, a really nice one in a richer senior living area. Aunt Pat showed me around the house and to the spare room which would be mine and left me be. I instantly called my boyfriend let him know I landed safely and told him about the flight and how weird my relatives were. Since I was off on my sleeping schedule, I ended up sleeping in until noon the next day. I groggily rolled out of bed and walked downstairs to get breakfast. I was met with a note on the fridge, explaining that they were both at the store and would be back soon. I ate, showered, got dressed and waited. They pulled up shortly after and whisked into the house with a huge bag. Aunt Pat grinned and handed me the sack. We got you a little present. We're both just so excited you're here. I opened it up to reveal a hideous star-spangled banner dress with accompanying hair pieces. It was so horrendous, but as rude of a teen as I was, I wasn't point-blank disrespectful. I gave them both a huge smile and a thanks. Rick pulled out the dress and let it unfold in all its ugly glory. We walk in the summer parade every year and want you to walk with us. A roundabout is flag theme this year. Why don't you go try it on? Make sure it fits. Weirdly, it fit just fine, much to their delight. The parade was in three days, and until then we would do some sightseeing around Texas. For those three days, I was completely ill-tempered. Everything they were doing was making me want to scream. I was so annoyed and irritable. They'd drone on about one thing, argue off-tangent about another, and they had a rigorous schedule that my teenage body did not want to keep up with. Waking up very early to go on a snail's pace walk, quick to bed at night with no TV, just basic old people lifestyle. But to a teen, it was hell. All of the tourist spots they took me to were very bland, and I was not in the mood to be appreciative. Whether they were starting to get annoyed with me or not, they never showed it. I wouldn't have cared if they were anyway. I figured they'd just send me home early if I did get on their nerves enough with my moodiness. So the big day comes around, and I'm garbed up in my outfit, ready to die of humiliation. The parade was pretty long, walking about three miles to the neighborhood. I half-waved and fake-smiled the entire way through, then followed the giant BBQ, which went on until late at night. Aunt Pat told me to stick close to them and to not wander off since I'd get lost pretty quick. About an hour of being glued to them, they started to keep less of an eye on me and focused on their friends. 
I walked off to get some food and decided to keep walking. It was a nice night out and felt good to get some fresh air and freedom. I watched some kids play with sparklers, adults laughing loudly and spilling their beer and started to feel a bit better. I kept strolling on, having a good time people watching, when I saw two little girls sprint across the street a couple of blocks down from me, waving sparklers. I grinned, thinking about my own little sisters, when I noticed a weird shadow just beyond where the kids had ran. My smile dropped, and I froze. Peering harder to make out what it was, the shadow moved quickly, following where the girls did. I figured that it was probably just their parent, but the hairs standing on the back of my neck said otherwise. I decided there wasn't any harm in following, just to make sure that nothing suspicious or anything wrong was going on, and I continued to jog down the street. I made it to where I saw the girls run by, and looked down the road to check if I could see them. There was a little play structure at the end of the street for the neighborhood kids to go play on, and I guess they probably ran down there to play. I made it to the park and heard giggles coming from the tube slide and a small pile of burnout sparklers on the ground below the entrance. I glanced around quickly and didn't see anyone creepy. In fact, I didn't even see a parent nearby. Knowing if my sisters did this, my mom would be livid. It was dark out, no one around for at least five blocks before the party, and it was getting cold and late. I made my presence known to not scare the kids and pretended to get a phone call so they could hear my voice and know I was a girl and hopefully someone they felt they could trust. Oh, hey. Yeah, I'm down at the little park waiting for you. Okay, see you soon. The giggles stopped and little faces peered out. They couldn't have been more than four to five years old. I waved hello to them and asked them if they were having fun. They nodded and clambered. I know how to talk to little kids since I've been around them for so long, so they warmed up to me pretty fast. While playing with them for a little, I asked where their parents were, if they knew where they lived. They ignored me and continued to drag me around to play games. I really like your dress. It looks like mine. My grandma got it for me. One of them did a quick spin for me to show off her bedazzled flag dress. I remembered then that all the cul-de-sacs were themed and figured they had to live in one of the houses around on Pat's. I asked if they walked in the parade and they nodded, and went off telling me about how fun riding the float was. We had a big flag float on our section, so they must have been up on it, and I didn't see them since I spent most of my time zoned out. As I was playing Super Sleuth, I saw a shadow move from down the street towards the park. I got the heebie-jeebies again and kept my eye on it. The girls crawled back in the slide during this and were trying to get me to catch them. Something came over me and I told them to keep quiet for just a little bit, that we were going to play a joke on someone. They loved the idea, thank God, and cupped their hands to their mouth with big grins. By this time the shadow figure was within the lamppost that illuminated the park, and I could see him clearly. He looked like a normal guy, middle-aged, just slightly disheveled, as he got closer to me though, the worse I felt. I was sitting on the swing, acting like I was texting when he came up to me. Have you seen my girls anywhere? I lost them up at the parade. He peered down the playground quickly. I hope they came here to play. He trailed off and gave me a nervous laugh. His story seemed to add up, but then again the girls only mentioned the grandma. Oh, no I haven't but I could keep an eye out for them. What are their names? This was the truest test, since the girls had already told me their names during me quizzing them. Oh, uh, Emma and Ava. Two little girls, blonde. Have you seen them? Wrong. Their names weren't even close to what he just bullshitted with. My creepometer shot up. I shook my head no, apologized, and went back to my phone. Since Aunt Pat was tech illiterate, she doesn't text, which left me stuck waiting on this dude to leave so I could call her and explain what was happening. Instead, he decides to pop a squat down on the swing next to me. Great. He starts to make small talk with me, 
asking me where I lived around here and what my name was, if I had a boyfriend. I kept my answers short, making up a fake name, saying my dad was coming soon to get me. His questions started to get more personal. If I was on my period, how old I was, if I was a virgin. I snapped at him and asked him why he was bothering me when he should be looking for his kids. That's when I saw the knife. He shifted in the swing and his shirt went up, revealing a huge knife clipped to his pocket. I tried acting like I didn't see it, and as I pulled out my phone to text my boyfriend to call 911, the guy snatched my cell. He kept asking for my passcode, wanting to see if I had nudes on my phone. I was scared to piss him off, and was worried that if I started yelling it would scare the girls into making noise. I started acting like I was into him, keep him calm, hopefully get him away from the kids long enough for me to get help in some fashion. I laughed and said I didn't have nudes, but he insisted on getting my passcode. I claimed it was some random four digit number and it locked him out of my phone. He tossed it back to me and told me my phone was busted. He then got up and asked me to come help him look for his girls, that it would be a faster search if I did. He pointed off down the street he had come up from and insisted they must have gone that way. I stood up slowly, trying to stall and figure out what to do, but he slipped an arm around my waist and herded me off. Maybe I should go the opposite way, cover more ground? I tried to peel away from him, but his grip was tight. No, they went this way. No use splitting up. He kept coming up with excuses to keep me there, and I was terrified of what would happen if he got mad, so I stayed quiet. His hand kept trailing down to my ass and groping it, and it took me every ounce of my being not to break into sobs right there. I felt so stupid. What was my plan? I left the girls alone. I'm alone with a crazy person and no one knows where either of us are. Then I hear the sweet sound of sandals slapping on pavement and a booming voice yell out, What the fuck do you think you're doing? Uncle Rick had come to save the day. He was running down the sidewalk towards me as fast as a 75 year old man can, which apparently is pretty fast. The guy suddenly let go of me and whipped out his knife aiming at Rick. I ran away and started yelling to my uncle that he had a knife. Apparently my aunt and uncle both have concealed weapon permits, and why wouldn't they? It's Texas. He whipped out his handgun and started yelling at me to get back. The man's eyes grew wide. He throws his knife in Rick's direction, turns to run, hops a fence, and keeps on running through someone's yard and kept going. Rick lowers his gun and ushers me to him and I started choking out what happened between sobs. He kept us cool the entire time and wrapped me in a big bear hug. We went back to the park and I crawled inside the tube to find the little girls curled up at the bottom together, asleep. Rick called Aunt Pat and I woke the kids up, congratulating them on staying quiet so well. We all clambered out when Aunt Pat showed up in the car. I got a good lecture from her and so did the girls. Apparently Aunt Pat knew them and their grandma and loaded us up and took us back to the BBQ, which was now shut down and replaced with a search party and police. The girls ran back to grandma and I had to explain what happened to the police and gave a description of the guy. Turns out they had multiple calls on him for hovering around the playground and following kids home from the bus stop. They were surprised when I said Rick hadn't shot the guy, just scared him. The cop turned to my uncle and asked why he didn't, and Rick gestures to me. She's from Oregon. Didn't want to make her liberal ass shit herself. The next day Aunt Pat woke me up early and drove me to a gym where she then paid for a trainer to give me self-defense lessons for the rest of the time I was in Texas. After the incident, I was much less of a dickhead teen and did a 180 on my mood. Aunt Pat didn't even call to tell my mom saying there was no point in worrying her if we've handled it. I don't know if they ever caught the creep, but I definitely have the skill set now to handle him if I ever run into him or someone alike again. I just hope I never do. I'll leave being a badass to Uncle Rick and Aunt Pat.
black stoop, in the dark, unobservable from the street, gently twisting the knob this way, then that. Click, click this way, then that way. I could barely hear them doing it. I wasn't a hundred percent sure I was hearing it correctly. Then they tried again, twisting softly, pushing gently. Thump, thump as the door barely moved in the jam then twisting the knob this way and that way again. Click, click. I shot up 150% wide awake. I sat up in bed, gently put my feet on the floor, and my cat raced up the stairs and sat down and looked at me. Like, finally human, come on, do something. She was completely silent after that. I stepped quietly onto the floor, called my boyfriend to ask if he was trying to get in the back door and lost his keys. He said no. What the fuck? He wasn't even in the same state, overnight delivering and driving. He told me to hang up, call 911 right now, and get the handgun. Turn on every light in the house but stay away from the windows, and to call him right back and remain on the phone with him until the cops arrive. I immediately acted. The door rattling stopped, and the cops came. They kind of beat the bushes in a circle around the house said it was probably just a homeless person trying to get in from the cold. But when both our downstairs neighbor and my fiancé were away, maybe, but still, it's not like it would take days of super sleuthing to connect one car to me, the other cars to the others, and deduce there was a woman there alone. They said they would increase the patrols on the street for the night. Fiancé raced home an hour and a half early from his night delivery run, and also circled the house, yard, and a lot on foot. Marine reconnaissance boyfriends are pretty awesome. Until that night I had never known my sweet little Siamese was actually a guard cat in disguise. I'd heard stories of cats waking their family up in fires or carbon monoxide situations, but figured those were already aggressive, extroverted, attention-seeking cats. My meek little scaredy cat would disappear when people came over, and was like an unseen shadow, but she threw down that night in her own way. Then she went back to being an unamusing cat, but I knew if she hadn't deliberately woken me up, I wouldn't have heard it. Even my fiancé, who isn't a cat person, was impressed. It never happened again, but ever since then I cannot stand to live on ground floor apartments. I require second or third floor like that one was. But I knew until the cops arrived there was only one way into that place, and I was standing at the head of those stairs, armed and ready. I use it quite frequently, as I had potted plants out there, but I have brought them inside due to the cold weather. I also have two cats, Luna and Eclipse, who until recently live with me. I'm moving soon and can't afford the pet deposit so my parents offered to let them stay at their place for the time being. Eclipse is Luna's daughter and only six months old, so she follows her mom around all the time. I'd usually find them cuddled up together on my chair or bed, and recently, they trapped themselves in the bathroom. Now that they're not here, it's gotten harder to pass off these weird occurrences as my cats. Doors are still being left open and closed, and food has been disappearing from my fridge. At first I passed this off as just being my usual self and just not remembering that I ate something when I was half asleep or bored. Recently, my boss gave me permission to work from home as this shift is brand new and the company is moving to 24-7 support and the building owner refuses to heat my floor for my shift for only two people. So, I've been doing that for the past couple of weeks and last week, I noticed the metal rod that acts as a secondary lock on the balcony door wasn't engaged, so I put it back. I didn't think much of it at the time, as my computer faces my balcony door, and I sometimes fidget with it with my feet while playing video games. On the 11th of December, my credit card information was stolen and my... So I just got a new job back in October working tech support on the graveyard shift. I work from 1am to 12pm Friday through Mondays. Needless to say, adjusting my sleep schedule has been quite the task, 
but I've managed. On the days I don't work, I still follow my work schedule, waking up at midnight and staying up until at least 2 p.m. before falling asleep to keep my sleep schedule in line with my work schedule. I bought blackout curtains to help with this, as trying to sleep with the sun shining is not easy for me. I usually require complete darkness. I live alone, and I started noticing weird things happening around my apartment when I would get home from work, or after waking up on my days off. Just little things at first, lights being on that I swear I turned off, doors being left open or closed. Just so everyone can get a bit of understanding about my apartment, I live on the second floor and my building is right behind the leasing office. The entrance to my apartment requires you to enter the building first, then there is a hallway with two apartments on either side, then you can enter the apartment. Each apartment has two deadbolts, one that you can unlock from the outside and another that requires you to unlock from the inside. There is also a balcony which faces east, complete with a large sliding glass door and screen. I was living in my first apartment post-college with my fiancé and my Siamese cat. My fiancé worked nights sometimes, and my little Siamese was the chillest, meekest little thing. The apartment was the top floor of a rehabbed house. It had once been an attic. All the walls were angles and the windows were in the eaves. The front door was at the bottom of a flight of steep wooden stairs and opened onto the external concrete landing at the back of the house. The back of the house was a wooded lot with some other houses nearby, but none in direct line of sight. I was used to my boyfriend coming home late. I would be dead asleep when I'd hear his key in the lock and his feet coming up the wood stairs. One night my tiny little shadow of a Siamese cat took to mewing. I could hear her sitting at the bottom of the stairs where the door opened, meowing every few seconds in a soft, questioning, but very, very insistent way. Silence, mew, silence, mew. Just barely insistent enough to bring me half awake at 2.45 to 3 a.m. I was lying there wondering, what the hell? I couldn't even form coherent thoughts, just vaguely registering the meowing in the completely dark house in a stupor sleep state. Then I heard it. The doorknob at the front of the stairs was turning, gently, Someone was outside on the back.